All right, on to our um, tonight's preservation conversation, which is a few months. It took us a few months to get here. Unfortunately, you know, Josh, we would have done this in March, but it's it's. Um, I'm just glad we're getting it. We're getting to do it tonight. I'm excited to introduce Josh Davenport, the co-founder and CEO of Seal Solar. I was introduced to Seal Solar last year when they offered to serve as a sponsor of the Spring Tour of Homes, and I also had the privilege to visit their um, historic office in Argenta. Founded in 20, 2012 by Josh Davenport and Heather Nelson, Seal Solar is a leading Arkansas-based solar energy solutions firm. It brings together the latest technology and a certified team to help homeowners, businesses, government entities, and farmers control their rising energy costs and save money. To date, it has completed more than 250 or approximately one in five solar projects in Arkansas. For more information, visit sealsolar.com. And I'll just say too, if, we, if there are questions that we don't get to tonight, you can certainly reach out to Seal Solar directly or you can reach out to us and we can forward those on to Josh. Since their founding, Josh has helped fuel the company's growth into one of Arkansas's leading solar businesses. Today, Seal Solar employs more than 25 certified professionals and is proud to serve homeowners, businesses, government entities, and farmers across the state. A top voice in Arkansas's energy efficiency and renewable energy industries, Josh is a member of the Arkansas Advanced Energy Association Distributed General Task Force. That's killer, and former president of the Arkansas chapter, chapter of Energy Engineers. He also serves on the board uh, boards of Argenta Downtown Council, North Little Rock Chamber of Commerce, and the UA Little Rock Alumni Association. Josh holds a bachelor, bachelor's in accounting from Washita Baptist University, a bachelor's in construction management, and a master's in business administration from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock and is a certified building performance institute building analyst and a BPI healthy home evaluator. So I think he's very well qualified to lead this discussion tonight. And then the other thing I would like to point out, of course, is that he's going to talk about several projects that they have had in um, our historic districts and on historic buildings. And the other thing I'll just pu put a plug in there is my dad was, a, was an instructor at OBU. Um, our TC instructor at OBU for um, for several years ago, so I have affection for OBU as well. So thank you all very much uh, for joining us, and I'll turn it over to Josh. Well, thank you so much, Patricia, and thank you everybody else. Uh, I first want to apologize; I haven't had my, a haircut since this all began. So uh, first, excuse that. Let me see if I can share my screen here and, and get us started. Um, So can everybody see the PowerPoint? Oh, Patricia, can y'all see the PowerPoint? I do not see it yet, Josh. Okay, let me. You should be able to share the screen, so. Screen one. Let me just disk. I've got three screens going here, so that might oh, be wow. confusing it. Okay. There we go. Now it's sharing. Wonderful. Okay. Well, um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Yes, uh, like Miss Patricia said, if y'all have any questions, type them into the chat box or I guess raise your hand, whatever you want to do. Very, very not formal. Um, but yes, we are Seal Solar and we're located in downtown Argenta. Um, I have been in Argenta since about 2007, so I've gotten to see the transformation. I love historic properties. Um, my dad actually owns the owns or one of the owners of the old Owens Funeral Home in downtown Argenta, and I live in a 1941 house in Park Hill. And so, uh, look, thank you all for what you're doing. Um, at our core, we want to take care of the earth and it's a lot more environmentally friendly to keep what we already have than to tear down and build new. And so um, I just I appreciate the cause. Um, <clears throat> I'll just start um, initially with kind of an agenda. And so um, I, I first want to explain who Seal Solar is. 
um, give you a couple of our projects, our portfolio. Um, and then I'm going to get into Solar 101 basics. We won't, we won't do a deep dive, but um, we'll learn enough of what's really driving solar in Arkansas right now specifically. And so that's going to cover net metering, um, meter aggregation, um, the warranty and the dur durabil durability of the panels. Um, why go solar now? And then also, what are, what are the risks associated with going solar? And then we'll dive specifically into historic projects and the other incentives that are helping make solar make sense, financial sense, economic sense. And then we'll look at a case study that I bet you guys all recognize um, uh, here in, uh, in Little Rock. And then we'll have a Q&A uh, question and answer period. And so <clears throat> again, if there's any questions throughout the slides, I'm, I'm okay if we want to do those throughout the process, but I'll let Patricia, I'll let y'all leave. So um, first off, who are we? And so SEAL Solar started in 2012 as an energy, effic energy efficiency firm. And what we did is we went into homes and businesses and made them more energy efficient. We would do that through changing out to LEDs, duct sealing, air sealing, you know, working on the envelope of the home, insulation. And as we kind of progressed into that industry, solar became the next step. You know, you first want to make something more efficient and then you want to talk about producing. And so kind of the analogy I use is if you're in a room and the lights are on, you want to, you'd rather be using uh, LEDs as opposed to incandescents. So and if you're leaving the room, then you want to conserve energy and turn off the lights. Once you've kind of gotten those two things uh, under, under control, the next step is to produce electricity or your own electricity. And so kind of the uh, conserve, preserve, and then produce kind of mentality. So that's what's kind of happened with SIL is we were in the energy efficiency and then got into solar. And then as of last year, of May of last year, we ended up selling our energy efficiency uh, uh, divisions to totally focus on solar because it was outpacing our other lines of business almost three to one. So today we've got about 30 solar nerds on staff. Um, we have done about one of every five installs. And right now uh, <clears throat> we have, and I just, I just did a recap, we've done over about 390 installs uh, across the state. Um, residential, uh, commercial, farm, farmers, bakeries, uh, banks, poultry, um, a little bit of everything. Basically, if a client, um, if one of their line items is electricity, one of their expenses, still solar can help. So um, <clears throat> we've done a lot of firsts too. Uh, we just finished up the largest utility um, owned solar, or largest uh, county owned, non-utility owned solar array in Arkansas in Washington County. And it's just really a neat time to be in the industry. Um, so, oh, oh, sorry. I think something happened to my, my slide, but I'll keep moving. Let's, um, well, one of the things that's really driving uh, solar in Arkansas is net metering. And so what net metering is, is it's just a billing mechanism. So let's say that I have, I have solar on my house and let's say that in January, my solar produces a thousand kilowatt hours. That's how we're all built. If you look at your bill, there's a couple of charges on there, but the highest charge is the kilowatt hour charge and the associated riders that are, that are associated with that charge. And so that's what solar does is solar produces kilowatt hours. And so in January, if I have solar on my home and it produces a thousand kilowatt hours, but I only use 800 kilowatt hours. So I produced more than I consumed. The utility will credit my next month's bill with that excess. So they don't write me a check for it. They don't monetize it. They just give me a kilowatt hour credit on my next month's bill. And so those credits carry forward indefinitely. And so what we do at Sill Solar is we look at a space's utility bills and we see how much electricity they are consuming on an annual basis. Then we can overlay that with what solar would do, whether it's on the ground or on the roof at that same location or a different location, that's called net meter aggregation. But we overlay that. And so we basically want to produce what you can consume and take, take down that energy charge on your bills. You'll still have the customer charge, but the majority of the bill, 90 to 95%, Will, will, will be reduced because of solar. It sounds really simple. There's a lot more into it, but for this conversation, net metering is one of the biggest things that's driving solar right now in Arkansas. A lot of times solar, a lot of times solar might not work at the location of consumption. And so that brings into net meter aggregation. 
and I'll give you an, I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate this with a farmer. We just completed a farmer solar array um, up and down in South Arkansas, and we built one large array. And an array is a series of solar panels. And we, we built one field, a solar field of panels. And then we coordinated with the utility to say, okay, this array is gonna produce a lot of kilowatt hours, and we wanna offset multiple meters that are within that same utility's footprint and under common ownership with the owner of the solar array. And so what, what you can do is you can produce solar in one location and then you can offset a well pump that might be a mile or two down the road. You can offset grain bins that might be in another county and you can offset a shop or a house. What that allows us to do is get the economies of scale of solar and be able to offset multiple meters that might not be right for solar. And so between net meter and net, net meter aggregation, it is allowing people that otherwise did not have access to solar to, to have access to it and it, for it to make financial sense. <clears throat> I guess I typically I ask, does anybody have any questions, but we'll push pause on that and I guess wait till the end, right, Ms. Patricia? Okay. So when you're purchasing solar, you're really buying power for about 25 to 30 years because that's what the system is warranted. It's warranted to produce power for 25 or 30 years. And that warranty is not held by civil solar, it's held by the manufacturer. And so these manufacturers are billion dollar companies. And what they're saying is, you, if the panel does not produce at a specified rate for the next 30 years, we will replace that panel or we'll make you whole. And so that's really the rub when it comes to solar is you're buying a bulk amount of electricity and it's warranty to produce that over the next 30 years, 25 to 30 years. And so I say 25 to 30 because different modules have different warranties. And what we typically try to use is a 30 year, a 30 year warranty module. Outside of that, you have a product warranty. And that is if the panels just fall apart, if they discolor, if the, fr if the frame breaks, and so we see those warranties anywhere between 12 all the way up to 25 years. But the important warranty, in my opinion, is that power production, that linear power performance guarantee. And that warranty is, what, is basically what you're buying. And so another way to think about it is what if someone came to you and hopefully this doesn't happen, but we end up using fossil fuels for the next 30 years. And someone says, okay, I'm going to dig a big hole in your backyard and I'm going to fill it full of gasoline. And I'm going to warranty that gasoline and I'm going to sell that gasoline to you for the next 30 years. But instead of you paying $1.50 a gallon today and maybe $1.75 six months from now, we're going to lock your price in at say 30 or 40 cents, significantly cheaper than what you're paying right now. But I'm going to lock that in over the next 30 years. That's exactly what you're doing with solar, is you're buying a fuel or an expense that you're going to have for the next 30 years in bulk, and you're locking in your price for a significantly cheaper than you're paying the utility right now. And so those warranties allow that to happen because there's someone backing that. <clears throat> Along with the panels, you, there is also an inverter, and that inverter takes the electricity, so the, electric, the sunlight hits the, hits the modules or the panels and creates direct current. That direct current is not what we use in our homes, we use alternating current, so we have to invert it to alternating current, and that's what the inverters do. And so those inverters typically have a 12 to 25 year warranty. So as you can see, the bulk system has at least a 12 year warranty, but most of the times we try to align the, all the components to have a 25 or 30 year warranty because that's the benefit of solar is you're buying power in bulk cheaper than you can today and you're locking in your cost of a, of a, of a variable rate for the next 30 years. A lot of questions we get about solar are <clears throat> wind, you know, what, what happens? And so every system, whether it's on the ground, whether it's on the roof, um, whether it's on a parking canopy, at least needs to be rated for 110 mile an hour straight line wind. So that's an F3 tornado. And so <clears throat> we, uh, whether it's on the roof, we hire outside engineers or our in staff engineers to make sure that that product is rated for that, that, that type of wind. They also are rated for hell, a one inch piece of hell at 51 miles per hour. And so that is a direct hit. Most of the modules ideally are facing south at about 30 degrees. They can face east or west, but either way, they're going to be at an angle. And so the hell is probably going to be at a, at a glancing blow. Um, 
That being said, we've been hired by four different insurance companies to remove modules so they could replace the shingles. And then we put the exact same modules back, solar panels, because the solar panels withstood the hell better than the shingles did. And so they're very sturdy. They're tempered glass. You can even walk on them. I don't suggest it, but you know, a product that's going to be around for 25 or 30 years, it gives you confidence to know that it's going to be there and that the engineering and the warnings are behind it to back it. So there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's several reasons right now <clears throat> why, why folks are moving, moving forward with solar. And I say folks are moving forward. In Arkansas, the number of solar clients has increased between 50 to 56% year over year for the, fa for the past three years. That's compounding. And so why that is happening, there's a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is up until now, you really haven't had a choice on where you buy your electricity. If you get in your car tonight and go to the gas station to get a Coke, you're gonna choose what type of Coke you want. If you wanna get gas, you're gonna choose if you wanna to go to Valero or an Exxon or a Phillips 66, you have that choice, you have that selection. You don't really have that choice when you buy or build a home. You're gonna to have to buy the electricity from the utility that serves that area. And so what solar is doing is it's offering another option. And so utilities are legal monopolies. They are regulated by the Public Service Commission. And what solar is, is, is letting people do is control a cost. They prior to prior to a couple of years ago in Arkansas, it really did not make financial sense. And they're giving them a choice. And so now they have a choice on how they want to buy their electricity and how much they want to pay for it. And again, like I said, lock in significantly lower cost for 30 years. The other thing that's driving solar, not only in Arkansas, but the nation as a, as, a, as a whole, is there is a federal incentive tax credit. And so last year that tax credit was 30%. We're gonna talk about historic tax credits a little bit later, <clears throat> but this is a federal investment tax credit. Right now it's 26%. At the end of this year, it goes to 22%. Um, oh, no, yeah, 26%, 22%, and the following year it drops to 10%. And so last year it was 30, 30%. Um, that is, the tax credit is not a deduction, it is a full one to one credit. And so if you spend $10,000, you're going to get $2,600, $100,000, $26,000, a billion dollars. There is no limit on the tax credit. And so <clears throat> for a business, that tax credit can be carried back one year or it can be carried for 20 years. And so there's, there's, you don't have to use it in the same year. For residential, um, the tax law looks like you can carry it forth to at least 2022. <clears throat> the other um, incentives are specifically to a business is depreciation. So you can depreciate the panels just like you would a tractor or any other piece of equipment. Um, Outside of that, there are USDA grants and loan guarantees. And another thing that we will talk about here a little bit later are um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the, historic, the historic tax credits as well. Um, one of the bigger, big, biggest things that's happened lately is on June 1st, um, the Arkansas Public Service Commission released an order that um, in regards to net metering. So back to the conversation we had earlier, or the illustration we had earlier, that I produce a thousand kilowatt hours at my house, I only use 800, and that 200 rolls over to the next month's bill. There's been basically an argument, uh, you can call it a, a, a docket or an online conversation, but it's been with the solar advocates and the utilities as to what is the value of that excess kilowatt hour. And so on June 1st, the Arkansas Public Service Commission, that is a three person appointed commission by the governor, made a ruling that basically for anything under a megawatt, they are going to get the full retail one to one credit. Meaning that if you pay 10 cents a kilowatt hour and you overproduce, you're going to get credited back that full 10 cents. In addition to that one to one credit, you're also grandfathered in for 20 years. So in five years from now, when we're paying 10.5 cents a kilowatt hour or 15 cents, you'll be getting credited back the same amount for that kilowatt hour. That's a big deal because if say a scenario where you buy a kilowatt hour at 10 cents and then you only get credited back three cents 
and 30 cents on the dollar, the, the, the economics don't make as much sense. And so to get that ruling, you know, what, 24, 25 days ago was a huge sigh of relief, not only for me, but for Sil Solar, but for the entire industry, because basically what it did is it gave us stability. It helped us realize, you know what, a client can make a decision today and they can, they know what the economics of that decision are going to look like for 20 years, which makes a lot of sense because you're buying a 20 to 30 year product. And so right now, the favorable net metering rules are definitely driving folks to look at solar in Arkansas. We're also seeing organizations, um, both nonprofit, um, churches, um, Fortune 500 companies have sustainability standards. We are seeing people take our environment seriously and start passing along sustainability standards. And so we have actually you know, seen projects that have fairly long paybacks, but the client doesn't care about the payback because they want to do be a good steward of the earth. And so <clears throat> that is also helping uh, uh, spur on solar. The last thing that I'll talk about is uh, a Senate bill in the last legislative, legislative session that became an Act 464. And what Act 464 did is it enabled solar leasing, third party ownership, and power purchase agreements. All those fancy words really mean one thing. The tax, the tax incentives that make solar make sense for taxed entities and for individuals that pay taxes are not applicable, obviously, to non-taxed entities. So that's cities and counties and schools and churches and nonprofits. And so their paybacks obviously looked a lot longer because they didn't have almost 50% typically of the tax incentives to help cover the cost. And so what Act 464 did is it allowed a third party that is taxed to come in, purchase the system, maintain the system, and then either lease it to a non-taxed entity or enter into a power purchase agreement, which means that they actually sell the power for all intents and pur purposes to that nonprofit at a reduced rate than they're paying the, within their buying from the utility right now. And so this also is a huge deal because it's opened the door up to help save taxpayers money through a really clean energy source. And so for all of these reasons, solar has just culminated into a wonderful industry that's producing jobs and is giving folks a way to save money and to be clean and green at the same time. So just like with everything, what's the risk, you know? Obviously, one of the risks is energy prices go down. And that, over the, over the life of utilities, has not happened, but that is obviously a risk. Someone could invent some sort of cold fusion reactor that produces electricity for, for free. Um, <clears throat> another risk is energy demand decreases. I don't necessarily see that as a, as a, as a significant risk either, because as the internet of things slowly grows, and as electric vehicles grow, and as data mining and databases and you know all the, the, the monster server rooms out there, I believe that we could actually see maybe not a significant increase, but um, maybe to offset the decrease. Um, the tax credit, that's a real, real uh, risk. Uh, like I said, it was 30%. Now it's 26%. It'll be 22%, and then it drops to 10% for commercial, and it goes away for residential. And so that's not a um, that's not some sort of sales pitch. That's a mandate by the federal government. And so there is a sense of urgency if you have the tax liability. Um, and yeah, one of one of the largest risks is um, the is with anything is policy and legislative. Um, the utilities, as you can imagine, have a lot of lobbyists, and this is, you know, a, I guess necessarily a threat. So yes, that is something that we have to, you know, keep our finger on. Um, and then the last one is kind of a joke, cloudy days. You know, you don't produce much sun when it's cloudy, but fortunately in Arkansas we have net metering, and so we can build up credits during the sunny days and use those credits during the cloudy days. We can build up credits during the summer and then we can use those credits during the winter. And so um, that's, that, that helps offset that risk a little bit. Um, other incentives and in finan in financing methods. 
Um, bonus depreciation, we kind of talked about that. Uh, new market tax credits, um, historic tax credits, applicable here, 25% state, 20% federal. Um, obviously the leasing and third parties, USDA grants. And so we've worked with a lot of rural businesses and farmers that will actually get 25% of their entire project paid for through the farm bill from the USDA office. And so you start coupling a 26% tax credit, another 20, 30% in the bonus depreciation savings, 25% grant from the USDA. And then if it's even a historic property, you can see how the tax incentives can add up to really offset the cost of solar. And so here in a second, we will see an illustration of that that I bet you will all recognize where the tax incentives did make a big, big impact. Um, and then the other two are, there's some uh, specific uh, organizations called Collective Sun and others that will actually help invest and be a part of the solution for nonprofits. <clears throat> okay, so this is a, um, oh, this is the roof of a bakery that I bet you guys have all been in, in Little Rock. And it just so happens to be, have a beautiful view across 630 of downtown. And so this system was a 35.7 kW system. To give you a little bit of a reference, our average residential system is 10.1 kW. So this is about three times as big as our average residential system. This system um, was a ballasted roof mount system, meaning that we did not penetrate the roof. That roof is a membrane roof, and so we did not penetrate that roof. Um, we actually used counterweights to hold the panels down, because again, we've got to meet that 110 mile an hour straight line winds. Um, <clears throat> we also um, had to go through the right processes in order to put this, because this was a historic building, and so it could not be seen from Main Street, and we had to go, th we had to go through the right authorities having jurisdiction in order to get this approved, as well as the city permit office. Um, in addition, we had to get a structural engineer involved because this is an old building in downtown Little Rock, so we wanted to make sure that it could withstand the weight of the solar, which in this case was somewhere between five to seven pounds. Um, this system, the warranty was about 25 years, and the production was <clears throat> the annual production back to the kilowatt hour, KWH, that I was talking about earlier, was a little over 53,000 kilowatt hours a year. And that equated to about $3,500 annually worth of savings. Now, that is just one year. This system is warranted to produce power for the next 25 years. One of the really interesting parts about solar warranties is that warranty after 25 years, the panel doesn't die, it's just outside of warranty. And so typically the warranty at the end of year 25 is around 80% as efficient as it was day one. And so, the point I'm getting at there is it's just like your car warranty. When your car is outside of warranty, it just doesn't shut down. Now, maybe it does in some cases, but typically it's outside of warranty and it keeps running. The same thing with these solar modules. In 25 years, if we fast forward, the day that those solar modules are outside of that 25 year warranty, they are still going to be roughly 80% as efficient as they were day one. So that's something to think about when, when you think about the panel warranty. Um, in addition, this, pro uh, this project is the equivalent per year of taking, you know, almost 42,000 pounds of coal um, off, off the grid, um, 4,200 uh, gallons of gasoline, and it's the equivalent of uh, charging 4.8 million smartphones. So I throw that statistic in there because that might hit, you know, <laughs> that, that hits everybody. We probably all have a smartphone. So here's the really fun part about this project is the total cost of this project was around $79,000, but this client did apply for the historic tax credit. And so we had to jump through, we had to jump, you know, we had to get it approved and that equated to about 19 or almost $20,000 worth of a tax credit. At the time, the investment tax credit was a full 30%. And so that equated to about $23,000 or $23,790. You also, like I said, can depreciate the modules, both state and federal. Um, and depending on your tax bracket, the, 
you know, depending on the tax bracket, that, that amount will adjust. And so the net system cost after the tax incentives was around $16,000. That equated into a payback of about 4.7 years. If the client would have gone for the federal historic tax credit, that, that would have been an additional about $15,000. And so the net cost would have been 515 bucks. That payback would have been less than two months. And so that seems really aggressive, but if a client has the tax appetite, you can start stacking these incentives and really take a big chunk out of the project cost. And so <clears throat> we have had really neat success with both state and federal historic tax credit just because of this reason. You know, we might not understand them as well as the federal tax credit, but there's a lot of really neat local sources that will help someone walk through that. And so we typically team up with somebody. We've teamed up with Amber Jones a lot. You guys might know her that will help us walk a client through the process. We have to provide the information. We might have to provide a diagram that shows that you can't see the modules from, from the front of the, the, from the front street, but either way it can be done. And as you can see, it can be a pretty neat payback. The bottom two numbers are the part that I love and you can ask our team. It's the part that Josh gets super duper excited about. And the reason I do is, before going solar, this client was paying to the utility after taxes and after, you know, after all those riders that I mentioned, 8.1 cents per kilowatt hour. At your home, you're probably paying somewhere around 10 cents. And so commercial and industrial uh, customers pay a little bit cheaper rate than residentials just because of volume, which makes sense. If you add up all of the kilowatt hours that this client is warranted to produce and we take into account degradation of the modules because they degrade just like anything else and you take into account weather patterns and you take into account a lot of factors and we have software that's smarter than us to, that does this and you add up all those kilowatt hours and you divide it by their true net cost you get to what's called the levelized cost of electricity and so in this scenario this client was locking in their cost of electricity at around 1.1 cents compared to they're paying 8.1 cents today. And so that's the part that gets me excited is I can actually go to a client and say, Patricia, right now you're paying eight cents a kilowatt hour with solar, we can lock your cost in and we can drop it over 75% right out of the gate and you can lock that in. That 1.1 cents is not gonna go up two to 4% every year like your utility bill does, it's locked in. And so that's the part that I love so much. Obviously this is one of the most aggressive levelized cost of electricities, but let's say that it was four cents. You're still going to a client and saying, you're paying eight cents. I can lock you in at half of that, or you can lock yourself in at half of that for the next 25 or 30 years. And so that's the part that uh, I, it just, the, the numbers make so much sense. Um, I had a portfolio page of some of our jobs but I don't know if it got left out, but so we can go back and look at it if need be. Um, oh, yep, there you go. Okay, Ms. Patricia, that's kind of the gist of what I had. I've got some other, I, we can, we've got a, a, a huge array of our projects online at sillsolar.com and I could pull those up now if we wanted to. I had a slide in here, I'm not sure where it went. Well, why don't we, um, I know that Shelly's gotten some questions and I've gotten a couple. And I think that if you wanna go into the chat, Becca Green had asked a question about that, um, the met net metering decision, which I think that has been answered, but I'll let um, Becca jump in if she still has questions about that. And then she also had a question about the, why someone may not do the federal tax credit. You know, they'll do the state, but maybe not the federal. And one of the one of the hurdles we see, obviously, is that you have to meet adjusted basis in order to get the federal one. And I would assume the adjusted basis for the community bakery building would have been pretty high. So that even though the cost of the project was almost 80000 that might not have met adjusted basis. So for the state tax credit, you spend 25000 if it's income producing property. So, um, so you know, that that is what I'm assuming might be a barrier for someone to go for federal. And the other thing I would say is, you know, for a homeowner, you can't do federal. It is only the state. Um, it's only for, um, federal is only for income producing properties, but it's a great pro program because there's no cap and there's no limit. And so if you are doing a big project and solar is a part of it, right? I mean, you could meet the adjusted basis. So if, if Community Bakery was doing a 
a massive project, maybe they would have met that adjusted basis. So, um, so I, I jumped in there, but you might have some other thoughts. Um, Shelly, do you want to jump in with a question that you have too? Yes, um, I have two questions from the same gentleman, uh, Chris Flores, and I'm going to give you the first one and then we'll go to the second one. The first one is, what are your thoughts on Tesla's solar roof tiles? Mm -hmm. If and when it comes out, will Seal Solar be certified to install it? So we are certified to install Tesla Powerwalls. And yes, our goal is to be the first certified firm in the state to install and to install the shingles. And so, <clears throat> or the solar glass. Um, my thoughts, I, I, I've never touched one. You know, I've, I've probably seen it on YouTube just as much as, as the gentleman asking the question has. Um, <clears throat> but I do have experience with Tesla and they are a, their technology is unbelievable. So the power walls that we have, and this kind of will shed light on the, the, sh the, the, the Tesla roof, the power walls are so smart that a power wall is basically a battery. I'm sorry. It's a, it's a, it's a storage system for the solar. They're so smart that they will watch the weather uh, unbeknownst to you. And if they foresee a storm coming in, they will self charge the battery. So they will take sun, they will take the power from the panels, fill up the battery in, 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 in not what, um, predicting that if the storm, if the storm blows out the electricity, the battery is fully charged. So it almost self protects the client subconsciously. And so that's just a blip of the technology that Tesla is implementing. The fun part is that it's mainly a software update, just like the Tesla vehicles is it's not a hardware update. It's a software update. So um, the initial question, yes, we, we plan to be one of the first and <clears throat> certified firms to install the Tesla glass. Um, I think it's probably going to be a no brainer proposition for someone that's replacing their roof, because if you start adding in the roof cost, plus the solar, plus the labor for the roof and the labor for the solar, and you start seeing the synergy between those two scopes of work, I think that it's probably going to be really hard that if you're going to replace the roof and you're thinking about solar, not to go that direction. But at the same time, we're seeing other players starting to get into the storage market as well as the solar, the, the panels market. Um, so, it, you know, I, I'm not real sure what the fastest horse is yet. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, I that, hope that answers the question. Th that being said, the, the R&D money is going to things like that. It's not necessarily going into the inverters. They're already 98 plus percent, so there's not a whole lot of room for improvement there. Um, the, uh, um, sorry, I was reading a question and I'm awful ADD squirrel. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, I don't even know what I was going to say. Oh, but the, the, the R and D money is getting going into storage and it's really for several reasons, but one is any innovation in storage when it comes to home power walls basically is paralleled with electric vehicles. So as these two industries expand and, be, you know, and grow, it's going to help each other. So they're very symbiotic. And so, um, yeah, I'm, extremely excited about the storage market specifically because this whole debate over what is a kilowatt hour worth is mute whenever an individual can store their own kilowatt hour and they never push it back onto the grid. And so that's what's happening. We have sold more power walls in the past two months than we have over the past eight years at SEAL. And so it's happening. All right, well, thank you. And the next question, um, that Chris had was, what's your advice for young people wanting to get into the renewable energy field? Man, um, uh, we've, we have got, um, we've had several internships over the past couple of years, and I think that's probably the, 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 the biggest thing is when we get someone young that comes in and it just wants to be in the industry. I mean, we've had people literally chase our vehicles down the road, stop our crews and say, I want to be in solar. That's the cool thing. I want to be in solar. And so I encourage them to chase vehicles. I encourage them to walk through that front door and say, I don't really care where you put me. I just want to be a part of this because this is where it's all going. And so squeaky wheel gets the oil and the same applies in that scenario. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. 
That is great. And, you know, we kind of feel the same way when preservation, you just got to jump in with both feet. Okay, Chris, I mean, sorry, um, I just was repeating what um, Shelly just said. If you want to take a look at the uh, chat, Patrick has a, oh, it's a question to me that was private. Um, but I mean, his question is really, how do we, um, how do we deal with, you know, if we are in a locally regulated district, how do we deal with, um, you know, restrictions on the location of solar, solar arrays? Um, you know, typically what we do is we encourage people to put them in areas that are not as visible on the secondary buildings or what have you. And, and actually when you were talking about some of these other, um, more, um, progressive type features, maybe, I mean, we've talked about, you know, the shingles that look like the like shingles that are actually solar. So I don't know if those are options, but I don't know if you've encountered that um, where you were not able to install a solar panel because it was visible or detracting from the historic district. So this is not an escape goat to answer the question, but we really lean on, 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 on people like Amber that do this, that do these kind of applications every day. And so we can provide all of the diagrams that are needed. We can provide what it will look like on the roof. We can take pictures, we can model it. Um, but that application process, we don't do that in-house. And so we've had clients that do the entire application process in-house, um, but outside of actually filling out the application, all of the content we, we can help provide. Um, <clears throat> and so, yes, it, it, you, you don't want to, I don't, I don't know if that, I'm, I'm saying the terms right, um, alter the exterior fabric, you know, I don't know, I don't know if that's the right term, but yes, I think that the shingles, the Tesla shingles will start allowing that to, to be more feasible because it's going to look like the, the existing, uh, the existing um, uh, facade. Right. And I, and I, and I appreciate that there may be a need to have solar and you may, there just may be resources that just because of the way they're, you know, located, you know, on the street, they just may not be the best candidates, at least, you know, for a, a big solar array on the front. But I know it's a challenge. And, you know, we are trying to figure out ways to make things more efficient. Um, yeah, we, we don't, we don't really promote cutting down trees that kind of flies in the face of, you know, yeah. our mission. And so, yeah, if it doesn't work for the house, it stinks. But we'll be very honest and saying, you know, I'm not going to, we're not going to put solar on the north side facing, we're not going to put solar on the north side of the house. Not going to happen. Um, I'd rather put it on the south side. I'm okay with east and west, but if there's shade, you know, I, I, we're not going to cut down a 50-year-old oak tree to put up solar. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, right, so right. We're not going to recommend it, you know. Well, and so, and I think that is part of it, too, is like looking at other opportunities for, you know, making our houses more energy efficient, too. But yeah, it's, it's a struggle, and, but maybe we'll get there one of these days. Um, there was also a very specific question um, to uh, from Becca, if you want to take a look at it, she asked very specifically about um, about you know what you need for a specific house. So I don't know if you can see that. Where do I see the? Oh yeah, right there. It says chat right in the middle. Yeah, right. click on that, and if you scroll up a little bit, you'll see Becca's question, and then I'll flip it back over to Shelley. Um, Becca, I live on Magnolia Street in Park Hill. Sorry, that was private. <laughs> um, uh. It may be too early to ask this question. Though. I'll go down a little bit farther. So I think you would address that first question. So scroll down towards the bottom and I think then you'll find it. It's uh, from 6.44 PM. Okay. Um, the additional hurdles on the federal tax credit, you don't pay taxes. And so if, if you don't have the tax liability, there's really nothing to offset. Um, and so yes, that has happened. Someone that's on a, that's on either on a fixed income or that's on disability or whatever, I mean, if the tax live, if the tax credit makes the project work and you don't have it, you know, that, that accounts for about 26 of the project. And so um, that has happened. Um, meet the adjusted base of the property. That was sort of the answer oh, about the federal. If you scroll down just a little more to about oh. 644, there's a good question from Becca. 100 square foot. Oh, okay. So we get this question, we get, we get a question a lot. How much is it gonna cost to offset a 1500 square foot house? You would think that would be such an easy answer, but what we're offsetting is the kilowatt hour consumption that that, that, that meter is using. And so I've been in a 1500 square foot house that uses 3000 kilowatt hours in a monthly period. And I've been in a 1500 square foot house that uses 800 kilowatt hours. So it really, it, it all kind of blends together. The energy efficiency side also affects the solar side. And so it depends on 
how, you know, what do you keep your thermostat at? What sears your heating and air conditioner? How much insulation do you have in the walls and the attic? What's your behavior? I mean, we've had people that keep it on 68, but crack the window to smoke a cigarette. So, you know what I mean? They're heating and cooling the outside. And so what we really need in order to give a free estimate is to look at your electric bill and on Entergy's bill, the top left-hand corner, there's a graph and that graph shows us the kilowatt hour usage. And so what we can do is send us one copy of one bill, we'll plug in that kilowatt hour usage and then we can give you a really specific quote that says, okay, Ms. Becca, you're using 12,562 kilowatt hours we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna size a system to produce twelve thousand six hundred whatever the same number you got the point what I'm saying you know and so it, it, you really want to match the system size to the actual consumption and oftentimes the floor the floor plan or the footprint of the square foot of the building might not play a huge role it does in some cases but really the behavior and the actual kilowatt hour consumption dictates the size of the system. Um. Shelly, did I do. I have one more Facebook question. Yeah. Um, which is, this is from Tony Johnson, who is a consultant in historic preservation, also one of our board members. Um, it's been many years ago, but I talked to someone who worked in solar. He suggested that we get our house very energy tight before we even thought about doing solar panels. What are your thoughts on this? Um... I don't have a, a zero sum answer there. I think that it really is a gut. And so what, what we will do at SIL is we'll use our energy efficiency background to see if there's low hanging fruit first. And so if you're in a 2,500 square foot house and your highest electric bill is $500, $600, it's easier for us to offset a $250 bill as it is a $600 bill. It's going to take less solar panels to offset a $250 bill as it does a $500 or $600 bill. So to answer the question, we kind of have some internal metrics. And typically, if we see that you're spending $0.10 cents per square foot per month or, or more, we might. It, it's worth asking a couple of, couple of uh, questions because there might be to be frank, lower and cheaper, lower fruit that's cheaper to, to, to reduce your, your bill. Entergy has some really good energy efficiency programs that you know we, we used to participate in that they'll actually pay contractors, certified contractors to come into your home and they will place a handful of light bulbs. Um, they'll seal your duct system. So typically your ducts are in an unconditioned space, whether it's in an attic or a crawl space, it's unconditioned. So any duct leakage to an unconditioned space is just wasted air. Um, as well as weather stripping around doors, caulking around, around windows, um, you know, caulking around plumbing penetrations. And so I, there's, it really is a, an initial conversation because if a person is spending a whole lot of money where they can reduce a good chunk of that with energy efficiency, we would rather rec we would recommend them do that. Now, that being said, there is times when we can you can do that in conjunction, and we've done that a lot. Is we've actually helped somebody or recommended them doing energy efficiency upgrades, taking those upgrades into account when we size the system. And so, for example, if we think that those EE energy efficiency upgrades are going to account for you know 10 to 15 percent bill savings then we just model the system to be 10 to 50% less than what it was. And so there's, there's kind of a science to it. Um, but yes, you need to, um, you need to conserve electricity and be efficient before you produce it because you ultimately will be producing electricity that you, you didn't really need if you would have observed the energy efficiency measures. So I, I, I don't, I think it's kind of a, um, a hand in hand scenario, not necessarily one's in front of the other. That being said, if we have a, a house that has 2000 square feet and their bill is less than $200 average or even, even the much, there's probably not a whole lot of lemon juice left in that lemon. So yeah, let's look at solar. Um, Patricia, I think there's one more kind of follow up question from Becca that I see there. Um, and I don't have any more questions on Facebook. Oh, so physical space on the roof. Um, so, well, our average size system is a 10.1 kW. So that's 10,100 watts. A 
Typical residential solar solar panel is about three foot by five foot. They're, it's a little bit off, that's about 15 feet and they're about 330 watts. So let's take 10,100 watts divided by 330, which is 30 panels. So 30 panels times um, 15 square feet, let's call it 16, it's a little bit bigger. You're looking at 489 square feet, so about 500 square feet. You can put the modules in landscape. You can put them in, uh, <clears throat> geez Louise, I just went mind blank, whatever, portrait. Uh, landscape. And so, um, yeah, so that kind of gives you an idea. And if you don't have roof space, we can do it on the ground. If you have a, a, a non-shaded area uh, in a yard or in a field or whatever, we can, uh, we, can, we can do it on the ground as well. Welcome. Very good. I don't, I don't know that we have any more questions. So what we'll do is um, uh, I'll switch it back on to do my share screen and close it up. And what I'm going to say is thank you very much, Josh. You guys may not have noticed, but Josh, show him that I, I sent you a, a t-shirt. You know, I always want to give it. There we go. He's got our, he's got our t-shirt for the, the season right now. So thank you. I'm glad you wore that today. Um, so I just, before we wrap up, I'll just again remind you that if you have additional question, questions for Josh, certainly don't hesitate to reach out to him at Seal Solar. They're very responsive. And if you um, if you need more info, you can reach out to us. But I just want to uh, kind of wrap wrap up our first virtual uh, preservation conversation and remind everybody that we are going to have another one next month, and it is going to be. Um, we're, we're a little bit off kilter with our weeks. Things have just kind of gotten jumbled up. It is going to be uh, Thursday, July the 16th, and it's going to be the Rack and Sack Folklore Society for Pulaski County. And, um, you know, frankly, it's a little bit disappointing because we can't have them perform for us in person, and they're just a magnificent group. So hopefully not in the not too distant future, we'll all be able to get back together and enjoy them. But I know that'll be a really interesting presentation. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do it via Zoom and Facebook Live so people can join in um, either which either format they would like to do. Um, but having said that, I'd like to say thank you all very much for participating and certainly reach out to us if you have any questions or concerns. And uh, folks have raised some really interesting points. You know, we are, preservation is sort of one of the earliest types of environmental, um, you know, saving the environment. You know, we have limited resources. So I agree with you. We, uh, we compliment very much the work that you do and appreciate it and love the fact that you're stacking a lot of those incentives um, along with the, the historic rehabilitation tax credits and they could, they could make that work even more um, economically feasible. Um, but with, with that, I think we're done. Thank you all very much for joining us. It was great to see everybody.